The six o'clock news starts right now. It is very possible the Rob School Memorial Fund could venture into eight figure territory. The bank account to provide financial assistance to families whose lives were destroyed by the massacre has already surged past $3.5 million. It's a considerable amount of money and who gets to spend it is still in question. Dylan Collier traveled to Uvalde to speak with the mayor about this fund and the subsequent scrutiny that's following it. Flags remained at half staff Wednesday outside the First State Bank of Uvalde. An employee with the financial institution that set up the Rob School Memorial. Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell, County Judge William R. Mitchell, and Mayor Don McLaughlin. That is not accurate. McLaughlin today distanced himself from that claim. Well, originally when they had to set something up, they needed three names. So our names were given them at the first. Instead, an advisory committee is now being finalized that will ultimately dispense the funds using a group that has worked on accounts stemming from past mass shootings in the United States. McLaughlin says the committee will not contain family members, but will be composed in a way that closely follows their wishes. It is comprised of Hispanics and and uh, other community members. McLaughlin making a vow that the funds will be handled properly. Our hearts are broken. My heart's broken. I mean, I don't think there's a citizen in this community whose heart's not broken. But one thing about this community, they always come together. And it's surprising how fast this money is dispersed. Look at the El Paso Walmart mass shooting in 2019, which brought in at its memorial fund just shy of $12 million. That money was then dispersed to victims and family members of victims less than a year later. Live in Uvalde, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. The funerals continue today in Uvalde with services for another 10-year-old victim of that horrific shooting. Annabelle Rodriguez. Her family remembers, remembers her as a sweet young girl whose favorite color was blue, especially on butterflies. She also enjoyed watching TikTok and spending time with her sisters and family. I raced to the hospital to find parents outside yelling children's names in desperation and sobbing as they begged for any news related to their child. Those mother's cries I will never get out of my head. If there was something that you want people to know about that day and about you, right? Or things that you want different, what would it be? To have security. Do you feel safe at school? Why not? Because I don't want it to happen again. Very emotional testimony at a U.S. House committee hearing on gun violence and the epidemic today. Parents, a fourth grade and a pediatrician all speaking about the horrors of the Robb Elementary School shooting. It was one of more than 200 mass shootings in the U.S. this year alone. Lee Waldman live on Capitol Hill where each person shared their testimony with the goal of inspiring some change there, Lee. Yeah, their testimonies were hard to hear, filled with pain, but also with purpose and calls to action. Even the youngest speaker, 11 year old Mia Cerillo, saying something needs to be done to protect other kids just like her. Graphic. Two children whose bodies have been pulverized by bullets fired at them, decapitated, whose flesh had been ripped apart. Powerful. He shot my friend that was next to me, and I thought he was going to come back to the room, so I grabbed the blood and, and put it all over me. Heartbreaking. Somewhere out there, there is a mom listening to our testimony, thinking I can't even imagine their pain, not knowing that our reality will one day be hers. My daughter is in fourth grade. So moving, California Congresswoman Katie Porter left in tears. Carolyn Maloney, chair of the Oversight and Reform Committee, opened today's hearing by thanking the witnesses and saying their words will inspire change, something even little Maya Cerillo knows is needed. Do you feel safe at school? Why not? Because I don't want it to happen again. And you think it's going to happen again? 
Kimberly and Felix Rubio will bury their 10-year-old daughter, Alexandria, better known as Lexi, in three days. Kimberly says she won't be the last if concrete changes aren't made. We seek to raise the age to purchase these weapons from 18 to 21 years of age. We seek red flag laws, stronger background checks. Their voices echoed by Dr. Roy Guerrero, who begged elected leaders to act quickly and save more families from the scarring trauma we saw in Uvalde. My oath as a doctor means that I signed up to save lives. I do my job. And I guess it turns out that I am here to plead, to beg, to please, please do yours. On the Night Beat tonight, we're also hearing from a pro-gun organization that was present at the testimonies as well as other elected officials who say there is work being done right now to make changes to gun laws. Live on Capitol Hill, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Great reporting from Washington. Meantime, a nine-member team will now conduct a critical incident review of the Uvalde school massacre. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland making that announcement today. Garland saying the review will be led by the Justice Department's Office of Community-Oriented Pol Policing Services. They're also going to be examining Uvalde's police practices, training, and communication, along with deployment of officers and tax tactics. The independence um, uh, and transparency and expertise of the Justice Department can go a long way toward assessing what happened in Uvalde with respect to the law enforcement response and to giving guidance for the future. The mayor of Uvalde, Don McLaughlin, releasing a statement saying that the city will fully cooperate with the review as needed. To read that full statement, along with information about the nine-member team, you can head over to ksat.com. And today, a local church took time to honor the victims in the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. This morning, the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church held a balloon release to remember the victims. Members of the church releasing almost 400 balloons, each one meant to symbolize victims in mass shootings since the Columbine school shooting back in 1999. We want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, the mass killing of our citizens is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, we feel that something must be done. The balloons release part of the church's annual food and clothing drive. New today at six, Texas, the state with the second highest number of long COVID cases. That's according to the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, which has been releasing guidance statements on each symptom of long COVID. Courtney Freeman reports this week they released new guidance on cardiovascular symptoms. For many people, recovering from their initial COVID infection is just the beginning. Upwards to 30% of people who are infected with COVID will go on to develop long-term problems. The Academy's president-elect, Dr. Stephen Flanagan, says some of the most serious symptoms are cardiovascular. So we know that their common uh, myocardial injury uh, has been reported in up to 40% of, uh, of individuals acute heart failure in a third of patients who've been hospitalized for COVID. We are seeing many people who had mild disease, were never hospitalized in the acute phase, develop cardiovascular disorder. Dr. Jonathan Whiteson is the lead author of the guidance statement, which he says has three parts. The first being a wake up call. A call to action for patients, for clinicians, healthcare providers, for healthcare systems, for insurance companies, for government agencies, for researchers. Second, they included specific guidance for healthcare providers on how to spot and treat long COVID cardiovascular issues. For clinicians not to misconstrue or underestimate what these symptoms may be. They may represent cardiac disease even in the absence of other cardiac risk factors. And lastly, the statement addresses healthcare inequities for minorities and underserved communities. After the hospitalization, this patient's do not have access to the rehabilitative needs. Um, they don't have access to equipment that they need. Dr. Alba Azola, who co-authored the paper, calls the statement a warning that inaction now could lead to a health disaster later. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Traffic authority right now. Let's go to I-37 to Carolina as we look towards downtown. Very nice picture there with the dome and the Hemisphere Park to the left. No major traffic tie-ups to tell you about. 
Well, new at six as temperatures rise in San Antonio. Tempers did two in city council chambers today. City council members discussing another plan to help bring down the city's greenhouse gas emissions. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us some of them had strong reservations. He joins us live now. So Garrett, what is this idea that's seemingly so controversial? Well, it's a strategy called benchmarking. Basically, owners of large buildings would have to report to the city every year how much energy they use. Then the city would make some of that data public. The idea is that the building owners would see how they stack up against other similar buildings, prompting them to make changes to make their buildings more energy efficient and use less energy. Overall, bringing down the city's overall energy consumption. Now, it's a strategy that city council members approved in fall 2019 as part of the city's plan to fight climate change. City staff have some broad outlines, but not a final recommendation. Now, because of property owner concerns about being shamed for their energy use, city staff right now only recommending that the energy score star or energy star scores for buildings that have a score of 50 or higher be made publicly available. Those are median or better scores, but it would be mandatory for building owners to report the info, likely with a fine as punishment for not reporting it. Now, there was some impassioned arguments from two Northside councilmen against the idea of making this mandatory. So, ladies and gentlemen, usually our fines are classy misdemeanor fines, which are crimes. So we're going to accuse you of a crime if you don't give Doug Melnick your homework. And uh, as opposed to saying, hey, you know what, why don't we give you guys some incentives to, voluntary, uh, uh, to voluntarily participate. Now, city staff believe the plan needs to be mandatory in order to get enough compliance and reductions in energy use. Though they did suggest today phasing in the plan over several years. Now, the city's chief sustainability officer said they plan to keep briefing city council members and they want to reconvene with some of the stakeholders, that'd be property owners, businesses, and eventually before the year is out, they want to present a plan for the city council to vote on. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Taking a look outside with live cam, 100 degrees out there. Did it inch upward, though, to 101 at some point in the last hour? Good question, and the answer is no, it did not. The last few days we did see a fluctuation between about 5.15 and 6.15 p.m., but not today. 100 degrees, the high temperature, and that's one degree shy of the record for the day. Elsewhere, we had highs well, pretty much right around the century mark everywhere. Fredericksburg, Kerrville, 100. Del Rio, 104, along with Catula. Gonzales, a high temperature of 101. Right now, 100 degrees down to 87 by 10 o'clock. We'll talk about uh, the change in temperatures as we get into the weekend, what other record highs are likely to fall, and African dust is not far away. We'll get to that in a bit. Staying ahead of the heat wave, why CPS Energy says its facilities are prepared to handle increased demand. With no end in sight to the stretch of triple digit temperatures, we're gonna check in with our power company on the night beat and fighting the pinch at the pump. Gas prices continue to set new records, but we're going to go to the pros to help you make sure your tank can go the extra mile and maybe just save us all some money. It's tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Meantime, looking live with Sky 12, steamy out there, not a whole lot of activity out there either. A lot of people staying indoors. Yeah, that's the zoo. They have their drive through zoo nights. Uh -huh. Great idea. Stay in the car, drive through. Don't see a lot of people doing it right now, but it is, you know, 6.15 at night. It is, but uh, what, what you going to do? I, I, I think it'd be fun to drive through the zoo. Which animals would be out in the heat? You know, I'm, I'm well, always curious about that. You have to figure the African, African one. The right? African ones would be, be okay. out there. The hippo's mm. going to be fine. Yeah, the polar bear, not so much. No, the hippo, what's his name, Tim, right? Yeah. Swimming around. I think yeah. his name's Tim. I could be wrong. Puts yeah. on a great show. Timothy, yes, Timothy. Yeah. I think his name's Hungry. <laughs> like the game? <laughs> yeah, right exactly. I get it. Hungry, hungry hippos. But yeah. bump. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving on now. So far this year, we've had nine 100 degree days. That's our annual average. Already have met the av annual average of 100 degree days, and it's just early June. More record high temperatures in jeopardy and Saharan dust. It's going to be here fairly soon. We're going to get to that in a moment. First, let's take a look at the high temperature forecast. We'll just rip off the Band-Aid right here and get right to it. 
And you see we're on the rise again. 100 today, 100 tomorrow, 102 Friday up to 104 as we get into the weekend. Friday, Saturday and Monday, that's when we anticipate more record high temperatures to be in jeopardy. So here's the overall weather pattern. Nothing but sunshine around here. Some fortunate folks in West Texas getting a few showers and thunderstorms, some downpours this afternoon. A little outflow boundary moved in along with a cool front and along with the terrain uh, circulations really helped get that going for them. But the upper level hides too close to us and basically right overhead. And it's going to be the dominating force in our weather for the, at least the next seven days. And there are some indications it'll move farther to the east by the end of next week, but we might trim off a couple of degrees at that point. I do want to talk about the African dust. Now you look at the satellite imagery. This is the geocolor imagery at Texas right here, upper left hand side of your screen. You get down into the Caribbean. That's where we have the dust and it's actually very visible here on the satellite imagery. That dust is likely to make it here in the days ahead. So let's take a look at the forecast and this dust plume. It's not going to be here by Thursday, Friday or even Saturday. Notice Saturday 7 p.m. It's out over the Gulf of Mexico. Some light to moderate amounts of dust in the air. But by Sunday, it's going to start moving in. Just add a little extra haze to the sky and then become a little bit thicker into Monday and maybe parts of Tuesday, especially closer to the Gulf coastline. I don't think the impacts will be very substantial, just something to keep in the back of your mind. If you do have a sensitive respiratory system and you happen to be sensitive to the African dust, otherwise just a little extra haze out there. 100 degrees, that's our current reading right now. Helotus 97 though. Randolph checking in at 98, Stinson 91. 100 in comfort in New Braunfels, so triple digits for most of us, some of us just a few degrees shy. Now by tomorrow morning, we start the day in the low to mid 70s, lower 70s in the hill country, Rock Springs, Kerrville 71, mid 70s elsewhere, 76 here in San Antonio. Then by the afternoon, back up to 100. We're just stringing the days together. And tomorrow, I do think we will be a little closer to about 103, 104 as you get south of town. Catula, about 104. Pearsall, Dilly area there as well. And in the hill country, upper 90s. Bernie, Bernie 97, Timberwood Park 99, Stone Oak and Leon Springs about 99 the high, but Elmendorf, Von Army and Lavernia about 101. A little bit of cloud cover in the morning. The typical low clouds very early and then sunny the majority of the day. Not as much of a breeze. A southeasterly wind at 5 to 10. And keep in mind, the humidity is going to drop down a bit during the hottest part of the day tomorrow. So the heat index isn't going to be outrageous. It may just feel like it's about 1 to 2 degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. I wish we could drum up some rain, but not even a minimal chance. Zero there as well. All right, game three, Boston trying to keep home court. Yes. Not turn it over Not turn to it Golden <laughs> State. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yes, Boston, their big problem, Steve, in game two was turnovers. Steve, you're so punny. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I know. I up to you, Larry. I know, man. I was a softball, and I struck out, bro. <laughs> hey, coming up, we're going to talk about game three. Boston wants to cut down on their turnovers that hurt them in game two. And in high school baseball, DeHennis has advanced to the 1A state championship game. Coming up. The Boston Celtics want to protect the basketball better when they host the Golden State Warriors tonight in Game 3 of the NBA Finals. Celtics head coach Ime Udoka says they're 13-2 and two when they have 15 turnovers or less this postseason, and they're 0-5 when they turn it over 16 or more times. The Boston committed 19 turnovers, resulting in 33 points in its Game 2 loss at Golden State. In their Game 1 victory, Boston only had 13 turnovers, leading to 10 points. Turnovers are a big part of the game, especially when you see how many times we turned it over and how many points they scored off that. Uh, you know, you just think if you could limit those turnovers, you could limit a lot of those points. Uh, and yeah, I've, the stat about, I mean, basically we don't turn the ball over, you know, we give ourselves a better chance to win. That's not rocket science. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know, doing that more often than not. Golden State is three and four on the road this postseason, but the Warriors remain confident they can win in Boston. Be in hostile environments where you get tested, you get pushed, you know, and our experience kind of shows at the right time. So 
obviously in this situation, it's a must for us to uh, win a championship. And we got to be up for that task. We know this team plays very well at home. And, you know, usually on our championship runs, you have to get a, a road win or two to complete the mission. So this is the, not a new scenario for us. And it comes down to just playing that brand of Warrior basketball that allows us to be successful. Warriors and Celtics will go down tonight at 8 here on KSAT 12. And Boston is favored by 3.5 points. Take you to Dell Diamond and Round Rock for the UIL Class 1A State Baseball Semifinals. Dehenna's taking on Abbott. Cowboys take control of this in the bottom of the first. Two on, no out. Ethan Reyes knocks a base hit in the left. Luke Langfeld scores the opening run, and it's 1-0 to Dehenna's. Line keeps moving. Dalen Gonzalez drops a base hit into shallow right field. Will Shavi scores from second, and Dehenna's ends the first inning with a 3-0 lead. The hits keep coming in the second. Reyes sends one to deep left over the fielder's head, and it gets lost in the wall for a ground rule RBI double. Then Shavi steps up and hits a bouncer that takes a weird hop over the second baseman's glove. Another three run inning makes it six nothing to Hennis. The Cowboys end up posting 15 total hits and 16 runs in a dominant 16 to nothing five inning victory. For the first time since 2019, to Hennis will play for the state title. Dalen locked in right there and we were able to come get three and the confidence just soared and we just kind of went on from there. We're getting contributions one through nine. It makes it tough. You know, there's no free outs for the pitcher. And, and that's kind of been the kind of what we've been trying to do all year is just, you know, every pitch, pressure, 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 and just and just make them feel you at the plate and, and uh, play good defense and throw strikes and see what happens. I'm ready. We all are. We love it. And we want that one tomorrow. The Hennis will face Nazareth in the Class 1A state championship game tomorrow morning at 9. Since the end of their game in five innings, the Cowboys will be able to use starting pitcher Dalen Gonzalez if they want to. So best of luck to De Hennis tomorrow morning. Trying to match what the ladies did. Yep. A little right. bit of pressure. There you go. <laughs> By the way, our case at Q&A coming up next, we're going to talk COVID, monkeypox, and the flu with a local ep epidemiologist in our case at Q&A next. She's been a frequent guest with us since the beginning of the pandemic, a disease doctor, an epidemiologist. We are talking about Sharice Rohr Allegrini. She joins us now. Uh, Sharice, thank you for joining us. I want to talk about COVID right off the top. I mean, it, it seems as if we're having high numbers of people that are coming down with COVID. Are we correct to say it's more transmissible, but not as severe? That, that's correct. We're definitely seeing more cases than we've seen in a while. We were very hopeful in uh, late March through April. Numbers were down. April, they started, May, I'm sorry, they started to increase. And we're at levels that we didn't see since late February. So that's concerning. Our hospitalizations are increasing, and that's our, our way to judge for severity. I'm still fairly low and, and still okay, but they, that is concerning. Talk to me about the reinfection rate of those who have the booster shot or maybe are overdue for another booster shot. Right. So the recommendation is to definitely have your three uh, doses. Now, if you are at higher risk, the recommendation is for four. They're certainly um, encouraging people to get that fourth. And that's not unusual for any vaccine. There's a lot of vaccines where you need four or five doses um, to be immune. Um, and we do see that reinfection happens, but the severity is much lower. Transmissibility is much lower uh, the more doses of vaccine that you have. Do you think it's it's because we have I mean, we still don't have a lot of people that are getting the shots that they should get. Is that what's driving this latest surge, you, you believe? Yeah. That's part of it. So our vaccination levels haven't changed much more than about 1% in the last two months. Um, and that's for most age groups. So that's really concerning. We have a good rate of vaccination at about 68 to 75%, depending on your age group. Um, but we really need to get upwards of 80. And, and that's concerning. And I did quickly look at the announcement today about the new vaccine. And that's very, very promising. It's not um, available yet, but it is very promising. But really, if you know, if we get enough people vaccinated, we'll have less virus going around, less transmissibility, and we'll be in better shape. 
Um, talking about that new vaccine and as well what we're about to face in the fall, we're talking about potentially having a next generation vaccine, so a new type of uh, mm -hmm. vaccination in the fall from Moderna. But also we need to think about the flu shot as well. Are we, how many shots are we going to be recommending in the fall? So definitely um, another dose of the COVID, I'm sure, is that we, especially if we get the new vaccine, is going to be likely. And we always recommend the flu shot um, in the fall. The last two years, flu has been very low. Um, this year, flu has really peaked in May, which is about three or four months later than normal. And I really think that has to do with us taking precautions for those two years during the what would be the peak of flu season and then relaxing those in the last couple of months. Um, so definitely we're going to need to get a flu shot. We will probably need to get another COVID booster, which means that those folks that haven't gotten their shots yet, we really need to get them up to date. So we're still seeing flu cases right now. Is that what you're telling us? Absolutely. So May had a surprising number of flu cases in San Antonio and across the country. Normally, uh, flu will peak uh, December, January. We'll see some into February, and it really stops to drop by March. Seeing flu cases in April and May is generally rare, but we're seeing a lot. It's definitely uh, the, not as much as we would normally see in the winter, but definitely much higher than we normally see this time of year. And it's not that there's anything spectacularly different about the flu that certainly Circulating. It's mostly that I think we were taking so many precautions up until recently that kept the flu at bay. And now that we've relaxed those precautions, flu is having a chance to spread. Is there a possibility that they're going to move up the time that they're going to want us to take a new flu vaccine? Well, typically it gets released in August um, and we push it August through November. That's the ideal time because that's the that's when flu season occurs. Um, I'm not sure yet if they're going to want to do it even earlier than that. Um, I think what we do is we really look at what's circulating in the southern hemisphere right now um, to do any tweaks that we need to do. But what we have plan for the fall for flu is, is what we're expecting because, again, our precautions that we've been taking, I think we're less likely to take this fall, which means we're going to have flu season uh, at the normal time, November, December, which is concerning if COVID is still pretty significant. I want to switch gears and talk about monkeypox right now. A lot of media uh, stories have been done about it, about the concerns that are out there. What do we know about it right now and how concerned should people be about it? Well, it's always a concern, um, but to date, there's only been 35 cases in the U.S. Now, that's way more than normal, so definitely it's a concern, but it's not highly transmissible. You need to be in very close contact. Um, it is in droplets, so it can be in your saliva and what you breathe, um, but it, the droplets are quite big and heavy, so they don't travel far. The other way it gets transmitted is skin-to-skin -skin contact, and that's more likely. So having contact with the sores is problematic, and you know, most of us are not in that situation. So we I don't, I don't think the average person um, needs to be concerned too much other than keeping an eye out for it. But it's not going to spread like COVID or, or even flu or, or some of those other respiratory viruses. I think there was a little bit of confusion because I believe it was yesterday or the day before the CDC came out and said recommended that travelers use masks because of monkeypox. Uh, then they took it off the website and kind of put it back right. on a, a few hours later. So there's a little bit of confusion as to that airborne well, issue. It, it is it is in droplets. It's in saliva. It'll come out of your mouth. Um, so yeah, masks will certainly help you, especially if you're in a crowded space. Um, being in close contact with others, and on a plane, you're in a crowded space. I was just on a plane and we were packed in like sardines. So um, that is that is definitely an issue, but it's not like it's traveling through the air. Um, it's, it's there's skin to skin contact. There is respiratory, but it's not traveling like COVID is or some of the other things that we're more used to. I still recommend wearing a mask when traveling um, because of COVID, because of flu, because of a number of other things that are in the air. Great advice. Mask up. Yes. Sharice Rorallegrini, epidemiologist with the San Antonio AIDS Foundation. Always appreciate your time, Sharice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you much so for having much. me. Thank you. We'll be right back.
New tonight at six, a group of high school dropouts will walk the stage tonight, not only with a diploma, but with a support system for a lifetime. The SOAR program, which stands for See Our Achievements Rise, is working to shrink the number of young adults who don't have a diploma. It stands at nearly 15% right now. Camille Juarez tells us about a program helping students pave a path to their dreams. Valedictorian Cristina Lopez never thought she would be crossing the stage today. Let us be free. Let's, let's get a second chance in life. But with the support of SA Youth staff, these students are a step closer towards their dreams. It's really just about changing their own perspectives about themselves and allowing them to see themselves the way we do, that they're special and that they have value. According to SA Youth, over 75,000 young adults between 16 to 24 in San Antonio are without a job and diploma. But within four months, students leave the SOAR program with their high school degree, as well as an understanding of their goals and marketable job skills. Unlike other programs, SA Youth staff follow up with their students for months beyond their graduation. Honestly, I, the staff checks in with them on a regular basis. We really do become one big family and make sure that they're doing well. Lopez will pursue a path in the military or get her college degree in child care. You're not always going to be stuck. There's always a way out. You just got to find that and be willing to put in that effort. The graduation is set to begin here at the Playhouse starting at 7 and these 15 graduates will walk the stage and while SA Youth hopes to have more people into this free program, it remains a challenge. To learn more on the program or how you can support, we have that on our website. Kamale Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Live cam 99 degrees, we are below triple digits. Woohoo! Feel the coolness. Ah, the coolness. so much better. <laughs> so I, I noticed the difference already outside, yes. Oh we're boy, so right. silly. Yeah, you know, we're in that kind of weather pattern and it makes you that way every so often. 100 degrees again today, that's nine so far this year which is our annual average. So we've already hit the average. Clearly, we're going to be well above average in terms of 100 degree days as we progress through the summer. We were up to 100 and even above across most of the KSAT 12 viewing area. This evening, temperatures gradually falling. Hey, 87 by 10 p.m., midnight 81, rising humidity through the night. An easterly wind at 13, so a bit of a breeze out there. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the aquifer level and how it's changed since the start of the year, along with current lake levels and some record high temperatures. I do think will be broken in the days ahead. We'll see you in a bit. A group of conservationists across several states trying to pull a fast one to save an endangered species. It involved zoo officials sneaking zoo-born wolf pups into wolf packs out in the wild. Eleven newborn Mexican wolf pups described as genetically valuable were bred in zoos in New York, Illinois, Texas, and other states in a plan to introduce genetic diversity to the dwindling Mexican wolf population. I want to know what the sneaking in part entailed. By the way, the pups were fed and cared for by teams of zoo biologists and vets, then transferred to two sites in New Mexico and Arizona. Then they were literally snuck into newborn litters in wild wolf dens. Experts say the pack mother will raise all the pups as her own, giving the mix of zoo born and wild pups the same survival rate. Sounds like a plan. OK, if you like the smell of Velveeta and you wish I could smell it all day long, a very strange wish is about to be granted. Volvita teaming up with a London-based beauty brand, Nails Inc., to launch its first ever nail polish collection. Sorry, I just can't believe it's going to smell like Volvita. Yeah. Marketing to the timeless and classy appeal of Velveeta, the two-polish collection is called Pinkies Out, and yes, it does smell like Velveeta. I think the whole thing's cheesy. The nail paint comes in a deep yellow color reminiscent of the gooey cheese product itself and also bright red for fans of the color used on the Velveeta packaging. You can sport the enchanting look and smell of spilled cheese on your fingernails all day. Why you would want to, I'm not sure, but Priceless. there you go. Priceless. Yeah. Okay, this will be tempting for a lot of Harry Potter fans, but only the ones with deep pockets have a shot of getting their hands on the first edition of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. It's part of an auction house's 
Art of Literature Loan and Selling Exhibition in London. The edition is one of 500 copies of the book initially printed back in 1997. Author J.K. Rowling signing this book, and it even includes errors that were fixed in later printings. For example, the word philosophers misspelled on the book's back cover. There's also another error involving wand found inside of the book. Christie says it's receiving offers starting at around $250,000 for the edition. The private sale and auction is slated to run through July 15th. So let me get this right. If it has errors, it's worth more? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Mistakes that weren't caught, I guess, before the first edition came out, so. No yeah. one minded. No. Take it to Pawn Stars, see what they say. That, you know what, they would probably buy Yeah, they're one probably of those. in line yeah, for one. I'm sure. All right, well, let's talk about our heat. You know, no, no, we're no stranger to 100 degrees so far this year, and yeah, it's just going to continue. 100 tomorrow, then we bump it up to 102 on Friday. Saturday, we're up to 104, and I do foresee three record high temperatures falling in the next seven days. Let's talk about the rest of the state because it's not as hot everywhere. There's actually a frontal boundary off in North Texas. So Midland 89, 91 in Abilene, Lubbock at 85, Amarillo 72. You get into Oklahoma temperatures in the 70s. Alpine, actually some rain cooled air tapping into some moisture right now at 77. But you get closer to home and yeah, triple digits, nothing but sunshine, 100 even right now. Dew point is 62, so it feels like it's only two degrees warmer than the air temperature. Feels like 102. Just like today, we're gonna have this, the, or the same trend tomorrow with the dew points falling off during the hottest part of the day. Dew points for the most part, lower 60s right now, so they don't have a big impact on the feels like temperature out there. That's locally. You get closer to the Gulf Coast, very thick humidity, dew points well into the 70s, uh, but their air temperatures are a bit lower. It's always a give and take. So let's take a look at the trend tomorrow. 7 a.m., dew point of 73, that's oppressive levels. Then during the heat of the day, the drier air aloft mixes down, and that alleviates our mugginess during the hottest part of the day. So heat indices will just be one to two degrees warmer than air temperatures again tomorrow afternoon. Right now, actual air temperatures near 100, but a little bit lower, closer to the Gulf Coast as usual with that higher humidity keeps the temperature down. Victoria 93 right now, 95 Bernie stage airfield, 98 in Converse and Hondo 101. Tomorrow morning, low to mid 70s, low 70s hill country, mid 70s elsewhere by the afternoon. Back up right near 100. Nixon Smiley about 102. Bulverde 97 and Bandera 99. I think exactly 100 here in San Antonio. Friday, Saturday, and Monday. Those are the days that really stand out in terms of record-breaking high temperatures. So that's something we'll, of course, keep you updated on. Some rain in far west Texas. That's where we have a little bit of activity. Otherwise, for us, the heat high is in place and no rain in the forecast. You look at the aquifer since January 1st, and it has really plunged. It's been on a downward trend since late February and continues to drop. Right now, we're still in stage two watering restrictions. And of course, we would let you know immediately if that changes. As for area reservoirs, well, obviously they could use a drink. Medina Lake, 16% full. That's 60 feet below the conservation pool. Medina, though, often a big fluctuator when it comes to uh, uh, summers and various weather patterns. 76 in the morning, 100 in the afternoon, and yeah, sunny every single day. Too many numbers. Yep. In, ca in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Thank you for starting your Wednesday with us. It is June 8th. It was some of the most powerful recounting of May 24th that we've heard yet. Dr. Roy Guerrero, Uvalde's only pediatrician, walked stoically into the hearing room, flanked by a police officer and several others. He was the second speaker we heard from today, telling the congressional committee how the kids he treats are like his own. Dr. Guerrero said the first person he saw at the hospital was Maya Cerillo. Today, he sat beside her father in our nation's Capitol as Maya's reported testimony was played. United States Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a review of the law enforcement response to that shooting at Robb Elementary today. 
Garland saying today there is nothing that can be done to undo the pain borne by the survivors and victims' families, but the expertise of the Justice Department can go a long way in assessing what happened in Uvalde. When fire broke out near the corner of Vincent and Palo Alto around four this morning, San Antonio firefighters moved in. They soon found out, though, that outside was where they were needed. It appeared that somebody had uh, started a fire on the outside and uh, it had traveled, got into the walls and into the attic a little bit. Crews put out the flames within minutes. The majority of city swimming pools remain closed. And it's because there's not enough lifeguards on the job. Right now on our website, though, we have a list of the pools and the splash pads that are open. All you have to do is head over to KSAT.com and look for this story. We heard through it a bit earlier. I want to show you again the area reservoir levels. Canyon Lake at 95% full. That's two and a half feet below the conservation pool, but one foot higher than this time last year, actually. Uh, you look at Choke, Amistad, they're lower than this time last year. Temperatures tomorrow back up to 100 degrees, pretty much an even 100 here in San Antonio. You get to Holotus about 98, Leon Springs 99, even Timberwood Park about 98, but Elmendorf, Lavernia about 101 for the high temperature. A little bit warmer than Friday 102, Saturday, Sunday 104 and 103. Record challenging heat on the way. Not good numbers. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for watching the news at six. It's good being back on the six. It's been a while. Good old days. Yeah. See you at 10.